5.1. So what we have is for R2 and R3, X transpose Y, which is our scalar product, can be used to find dot 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 one length because the length of an object is just going to be the scalar product with itself to the one half power and uh, orthogonality, perpendicularness, I suppose, again, the angle component of x and y by saying that the cosine of theta is inner product divided by length of x, length of y. So we know everything about distances and angle type of concepts. In other words, this idea of contribution by finding cosine. And this was only for, this was strictly interpreted around Euclidean geometry in classical sense physical space, right? Perpendicular literally meant perpendicular. I saw this thing existed at 90 degrees. Now, once I go up into fourth dimensional space, fifth dimensional space, nth dimensional space, this idea of seeing things at 90 degrees doesn't really make sense anymore, right? Because it's not a physical thing that we can visualize. So if I go up to Rn, The idea strictly of an angle, right, is gone, right? Because we wouldn't, I mean, being three-dimensional creatures, we couldn't even see it, right? But on the other hand, I don't actually have to worry about angle, and distance becomes awkward as well, right? In terms of, these are things that we can't physically see. Uh, but the mathematics is something that we can use. So whether or not it's physical to you anymore doesn't matter. What we'll just simply say is, hey, since inner product, the scalar product itself can handle one dimension and it can handle two dimensions and then it can handle the third dimension, but on the other hand, it can actually go up as much as you want. And since it goes up as much as you want, we can leave this idea of physical interpretation and just simply say, hey, what numbers do you get? And then we'll use those numbers to apply words like orthogonal. And on the other hand, does it still work as you go through it? And it ends up being that for Rn, we still have the fact that it's still true that a idea of a length squared being this object, scalar product with itself, would still apply. Um, we still have, and this is important, we still have the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We would still have that if you would take a scalar product's magnitude, it's always going to be less than or equal to the square root of x scalar product with itself, square root of y scalar product with itself, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality still holds. If the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality still holds, that immediately says that this is less than or equal to 1. But if an absolute value is less than or equal to 1, it says this thing is between minus 1 and 1. Since those are between minus 1 and 1, so in nth dimensional space, this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is literally just simply saying that a inner product between these nth dimensional objects by the inner product to the half of itself, the inner product of it half to itself, and then if this inequality still holds, we can go ahead and simply say, hey, let's just call this the cosine of theta. It's good enough. <laughs> cosine of theta is a ratio of objects, right? 
that end up being always between negative 1 and 1. So let's go ahead and simply call it cosine theta. And we'll have this. And by doing this, we can actually say that I can talk about angles between these higher dimensional vectors because they're just interpreted by the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So all of that stuff still applies. And then the last thing that we can have on this by doing the cosine theta, we can go ahead and say we can call two things orthogonal if they're transpose, sorry, their scalar product x transpose y is simply zero. We'll call them orthogonal. Yes, sir? You have four items, but you only listed three of them. Did you miss something? Mm, one, two, three. Oh. Counting is difficult for me, I'm sorry. Which also says that our projection formulas all still apply. So we can go up into nth dimensional space. Uh, I can't see the angle. Lengths I can't see, but there are numbers that come out. And so we can go ahead and use our scalar product for nth dimensional objects. Uh, in a couple of sections, we'll simply say, okay, this scalar product has particular features that make it a scalar product. So what makes scalar products scalar products are, are things that we're going to have to think about when we go into say, hey, what about other vector spaces? Is there a thing that acts like this that a mixing of two objects in a particular way so that I could also use it to understand magnitudes and this angle contribution? And if we do that, we'll eventually, if we can reinterpret the scalar product, we can talk about, hey, what's the angle between two matrices? Well, we're going to have to have, <laughs> it's not, and it doesn't have a physical interpretation, right? But it has a mathematical interpretation. And that will become important when we do things like, honestly, uh, uh, search on words, right? Because that's this idea of angle contribution when you do a, a search in a particular way. All right. So V is a vector space. And say it's Rn, which is what we're looking at. And the scalar product allows us to study magnitude and directions. within Rn. So I'm studying this internal structure of it. One of the things that might be interesting to us is since we're allowed to study this idea of magnitudes and directions within Rn, uh, one of the things that we did with vector spaces is given a vector space we actually looked at subspaces of a vector space. So we're able to study magnitudes and directions by just simply using the scalar product. Um, if I was given subspaces of V, which is what? What's a subspace? It's the, it has a zero on the end. It's a subset of V that has one. The zero object is in S, my subspace. And then the second and the third are what? If V is in S, then alpha V is staying in S. And if V1 and V2 are in my subspace, then V1 plus V2 are still in my subspace. I have the closure properties within the elements of my subspace. 
and I have the zero object within the element, and so this subset is actually a subspace. So, for example, if I take, say, R4, and I took the span of, say, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0. This span, if I call this S, I'm really taking the span of what? What's another way of writing that first thing? That's E1, and what's this guy? E3. I'm actually taking the span of E1 and E3. So what's the dimension of this? I know the dimension of S is 2. I'm spanning this particular thing. This span, the span of using these, these two vectors is always going to form a subspace. Right, given any two vectors out of this, you're going to be given that are linearly independent. You're going to however many vectors you have as a dimension, and this thing will actually be a subspace. So I'm sitting here looking at fourth dimensional space. What does S look like? What's the physical? It looks like a plane, right? So in fourth dimensional space, I have this plane. So S is this plane through here. Now let's say we would compare that to. A t is equal to the span of 0, 1, 0, 0. What physical object is that? So that's actually the what? It's the span of E2. What's the dimension of t? 1. So what type of object is this? It's a line. So inside of fourth dimensional space, I have a plane and I have a line. Now, what does everything that's in S, so any little s that's in S, looks like what? S is going to be something times E1 plus something times E3. And any T that's in T is going to look like what? Something times E2. I might, instead of the alphas, maybe I'll just use a, b's, and c's. Something, 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 right? It kind of seems an odd way of looking at this, but that's fine. On the other hand, what do I notice about S transpose T? That looks like what? A, 0, B, 0. What does this look like? 0, C, 0, 0. Is everybody okay with that? That's the coordinates of this in standard. What's the inner product of this? A, 0, B, 0 times 0, C, 0, 0. Do that scalar product. What do I get? 0. So what does that tell you about S and T? What did S actually represent? The entire span. Every single vector. I didn't give you numbers, right? Every vector that exists within S is a vector like that. Every vector that exists within T is a vector like that. Every vector in S is orthogonal to every vector in T. So what I just showed, so every vector in S is orthogonal to every vector in T. So if I have one subspace and another subspace, which they're two completely different objects, one's a plane, one's a line. But what I know is every single vector in this one, no matter what vector you pick, is going to be orthogonal to every single vector in the other, no matter what vector you pick. 
If that's true for these two subspaces, we're going to simply call this if every vector of S is orthogonal to every vector of T, we shall call S and T to be orthogonal subspaces. All right, I have one word, orthogonal. <laughs> if I write this, and I use the word, x is orthogonal to y, what do I really mean? It means that. That's what that means. They're at 90 degrees, but 90 degrees doesn't make sense for higher dimensions than 2 and 3, and so we just simply say orthogonal. If I say this, and I use the word orthogonal, it's a completely different type of orthogonality. It's a question of not this vector, this vector, it is what? Subspaces. This entire subspace's vectors, every single one of them, is orthogonal to every single one of these guys over on this side. And so this simply means for all x's in x and all y's in y, the x and the y are orthogonal. It has one word, but they have two interpretations, depending on context. And we're going to use orthogonal a third time, and it's going to have a completely different context. And it actually is going to become really weird because the third time that we use this, we're going to say that matrices are orthogonal. But what we really mean, when I say orthogonal matrices, I mean that every vector of one matrix is orthogonal to every ve column vector of the other matrix and of itself, sorry. Every column vector is orthogonal to every other column vector and the column vectors are of length one. And so we actually have another idea of a, a separate oomph on it, but we still use the same word. And so we have to be careful, right? When I say the word orthogonal, you have to get a context of what we're actually meaning. Um, why will this be important? Why are we interested in orthogonal subspaces? The idea here and the goal of this end con concept is to have some sort of larger vector space, say Rn, and in Rn is a vector, let's say V. And in, within this, I'm going to have two subspaces. I'll have, say, I don't know, I'll write it as like a plane like this, and I'll call that subspace S. And I'll have some sort of other subspace, and I'll make it into, let's make it into a volume, because it's maybe it's three-dimensional. I'll call that T. So S is a subspace of Rn. T is a subspace of Rn. S and T are orthogonal. And so that's one thing that's going to happen, two things, three and four. If I would take um, any vector that's in Rn, can be broken up into two parts. It can be broken up into something times little s plus something times little t is v, or that guy. In other words, all vectors can be uniquely resolved into take a piece out of this subspace, take a piece out of this subspace, put them together, and I get the original vector. In other words, what it allows me to do is to break the entire subspace into two parts. The part that's generated by one subspace and the part that's generated by the other subspace. And these in particular, if this is true, they're gonna be called orthogonal complements. 
And so now what we're going to do is we're going to try to break up an entire subspace into two parts that are orthogonal to each other. The idea behind this is consider R2. What's the nice thing about R2? When you break it up into two orthogonal subspaces that happen to be at what? 90 degrees. What we're going to do is we're going to break spaces up into two orthogonal components that are at 90 degrees, except the components are of higher dimension than one. That's our goal. All right, that's it.